pin. So I'm going to be talking today about requirements in the city. Um, and uh, at a certain level, um, this is a, uh, this can be viewed as kind of a, a dry topic. Um, most people in this class are, you know, keen to be hands-on and get code in place and maybe you know, supporting tests or design elements, et cetera. And requirements often seem like some of these fluffy things that are just needed along the way and um and um they need to be attended to but they're not really central to value i'm going to be talking today about a key issue when it comes to the system says at least as important as things like testing and things like like covering it has to do with the iron triangle does anyone in here know but the iron triangles, people heard that term before. Yeah, and name again. Sashti. Sashti, yeah. I think it is scope, cost, and um, requirements. Okay, so you, you've got a key element. So cost. What are what are other two elements? Scope. Scope. Okay. So scope is sometimes also also substituted as value is sometimes used here but i actually prefer scope um because value can come from from other things what's uh what's the the third one this james and risk is something which ends up your ability to to deliver um within this triangle but it's actually gives the t yes uh g i Yes, time. Exactly. Time. This, this is our iron triangle. And the idea here is look, if you only want to achieve one, it's very easy. If you want to achieve two, you can often do it in the short term by sacrificing the third, right? If I want to achieve something for for low cost and with a decent scope, if you give me a you know, forever to do it in my spare time, uh, I can deliver it, right? If I want to do something really quick and you give me enough money and, um, and, and or if I want to do it really quick for, uh, for a uh, decent scope and you give me enough money, I could, you know, hire a all-star team and, and, and achieve it. Um, uh, if I want to do it with the minimum, minimal scope, I can do it. Um, I can, I think by sacrificing scope, I can do it within a, a short short time and, and lower cost. The idea is achievement two is hard. Achieving, excuse me, achieving two is relatively easy. Achieving all three is really hard. We live within this iron trying to trying to stay and achieve simultaneously all three of these is very, very difficult. But Proper attention to requirements is one of those things that will hit on all three issues. It allows us to achieve our goals with respect to all three. And, and sacrificing effective understanding requirements will often impair time by requiring us to rework certain things, impair costs, because we have to pay people to rework them. And it will fail to achieve the Scope for value uh, sought by the by the users uh, along the way. So, what is a requirement? Well, you tell me. What, what's a requirement? If I talk about the requirement first. What is a requirement? It's flashing up there, but what is it? Yes, please. Yeah, that needs to be done in like one dot before the next. Good. Okay. So it's something that needs to be done for what? For the for the project. Said, right? Yeah, fulfill to make the project successful, right? So to allow it to complete. Um and very wonderful, very, very thoughtful and, and very prominent commentator um within uh software software uh, development or gives it like 
it's a, it's an attempt to discover what project is desired by people to be successful. But, you know, what what are they thinking desire? He broke it down though in more more details. Um, emphasize in a couple words. It's an attempt. It doesn't just come about magically. To to discover, you're you're actually learning what is wanted for the the product. Project that holds is 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 thought right by the stakeholders, and there may be more than one, and they may have somewhat different visions. Um, but you know what are they seeking? And some some years I've, I've wondered, you know, how prominently to, to feature this, but I do so reliably because. Project after project, you're going to need to elicit requirements. Occasionally, you're in a situation where you have so much latitude and you know the issue so well that you don't need to. But typically, if you're building something for someone, you need to get some understanding of what their needs are. And it, it turns out that understanding their needs, understanding what's wanted by, by the people, to, discovering it is oddly hard. It's particularly hard when there are language barriers, when you're working with a respirologist, for example, to elicit understanding of what the app needs to do. And you're not speaking necessarily common language about, uh, about what will be used to describe interactions with the app, et cetera. So the goal here is to motivate to take it seriously, it provide some very concrete tips for eliciting it more, reply, uh, more reliably and, and making sure your system doesn't fit certain components and helping to document those requirements and, and ensure that that um, you you have them captured and they don't change uh, by fiat. So it turns out that, well, this may sound like an nice, um Failure to attend to effectively to requirements um, is one of the top, like one or two causes of runaway projects. Projects which, what do I mean by runaway projects? Anyone? I say a runaway project. Yes, so right. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a project which isn't convergent where the scope gets higher and higher and higher, it just keeps on going on in a way that's long past its anticipated deadlines, often cost, it's not achieving its goals. And along the way, the goals may be changing because so much time is elapsing, the business needs change. And people say, well, if it's taking us long, we want more features in it. And, and it just carries on and, and, and gets worse and worse up and it spirals worse and worse. And I've been brought in as a consultant on those sort of projects because things get, get very dicey between the clients and the, and the project teams and they often need outside, outside help. Um, so really, you know, it, it bears noting that, look, to, discuss, to try to get to where you want to go, you need to decide where you want to go. In order to get where you want to go, you have to decide where you want to go first. I think you, you have to be clear about where you want to go. And it turns out that if you're clear about the requirements, you can often save a huge amount of money. And it's sometimes brought out that, that you know, finding a defect at different stages of a project um, imposes very different cost profiles. If a defect creeps in early on in like the requirements phase, it costs a very modest amount of of money to spot if it's found early. If it's crept in um at excuse me, if it if it's only found later, if a requirement problem is only found, for example, in the the uh phase of say implementing uh that requirement, it'll cost uh more to fix. Why is that? Why would it cost more to fix if it's found later, say after implementation started? Common sense, yeah. Um, uh, uh, Mara, Mara, Mara. Uh, you're already visual already a lot of dependencies on that requirement. You just want to have to yeah. Uh, I have to refactor. So that's right. It's code is maybe better for this, but 
There's more than code. There's interdependency. What other things besides code might have to be thought about? Anyone? Or read them? Yes, right. Documentation that you're fascinated Doc Documentation, yeah. So maybe design diagram on uh, key. Testing or system design. Testing that's been based on that. Design um, elements that have been put into place for this. Um, that's right. And that script for for manual testing, uh, you know, Selenium scripts or or uh, scripts uh, or you know, uh, Jest, uh, for example, snapshot tests or what have you. So, so if you discover it during implementation, it's it's bad. But beyond that, if you get it to the later stages, like at the point of delivery where the user spots you know, an acceptance test phase, it's even worse. And what's even worse than that is if you discover it once it's been deployed and the user is using it and it's in operation and suddenly they've been using it and you realize, oh, it's not working properly for what they wanted. And now I've got to fix it and stay compatible with how they have been using it and, and cut over the previous use of it properly to the corrected version. And, and essentially this goes up exponentially. It gets more and more expensive the further it goes on. A lot of it is because of rework and dependencies and subtle dependencies. It's not just what is written in code directly. It is it is the whole set of other things linked to that code, the requirements, the tests, the documentation, right? And the understanding on our part, you have different parts of your team who keep in sync about what's needed. And now you've got to update all their mental models of what's needed. It's very expensive. It turns out that um, there's been some really interesting experiments done with with requirements. So um, taking building a system, observing how much time it takes to build up a system from scratch, where the requirements are kind of being discovered along the way, etc. You know, there's requirement solicitation happening versus taking the fully documented system where all the requirements have been figured out and giving it to another system with comparable skills build from scratch, but with a complete understanding of what's needed. They're given, you know, a, a snapshot of what, what's required in terms of the user interface, in terms of the functionality, precise clarity on all of them. Maybe they even have a comparable system to look at and say, you, you know, you need to implement this from scratch. It turns out it requires like less than 5% of the effort to deliver the second time. If you're clear about all these issues, because you could start making decisions that reflect uh, reflect this, it's it's quite remarkable to to imagine, but um, it's a small fraction of the of the original uh, of the original cost. So when I said this addresses all elements of the pie triangle, why is that? Well. A lot of reasons. I, I mentioned it earlier, but one of the things, one of the main reasons, which was mentioned, was non redundant development, right? You're not writing code or tests or requirement specs or, or get in place design plans, which then have to be thrown off, right? Um, you're finding bugs earlier often or finding problems earlier, which otherwise would have just been left there because you thought that was how it was supposed to work. Customers are happier and, and they are going to be able to better focus on other areas of the system and be less distracted by these so they can put their efforts into other things. And generally it will help development be, be more effective. So. When it comes to quality, delivery speed, time, cost, the economy says be with it. You know, all of those end up being being helped in this iron iron triangle. Um, yeah.
clear expectations on the part of the developer to eliminate this needless development, lower risk. Um, uh, you document change needs. Um, you eliminate, you know, sprints desperately to, to fix the issue, which then let other risks pop up, uh, improve maintenance, and lots of other problems. Okay, so let's let's talk about some major issues that come up with requirements. So this is mm -mm. requirements are great. Requirements are 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 so important. Okay, great. So one of the major problems with requirements. Why is it oddly hard? Why is it? What can go wrong with requirements? This is so important. Why is it trivial? Yes, here. Yeah. 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 That's a lot of. It. So there's all this domain knowledge in the stakeholders or multiple sponsors' heads, and trying to get it out of their heads in terms you can understand is a big part of it, right? In terms that you're really clear about what is being sought. So, so that's right. There's there's a lot that they understand about their needs and about how this system will fit into respirologists guides and how they'll interact with end users about it, or how long COVID patients will interact with their data, or about certain certain needs in terms of the diversity of types of phones people have, or what have you, that you don't have. So that's part of it. That's right. What else can go wrong? Yes, Barman. Right. Uh, sometimes the stakeholders don't know what they exactly Yes. That's such a big issue. So, well, um, we as computer scientists, day in, day out, we work with user interfaces with different codes. You know, most of us are serious power users. And we live and breathe this. Our classes are about this. You're building these systems. You're just constantly thinking in these terms how to build systems, what they look like, the variety of different systems you see. You do interchangeably, you know, Macs and Windows. And, and Linux or what have you, you're familiar with web apps and smartphone apps on iOS and on Android. You have this whole diversity of experience because that's our area. But most end users don't like that, right? They, they might be iOS users. They've never had anything by an iOS phone. They're probably less power users. And their conception about what is possible when it comes to different interfaces but they're also, you know, they're they're dealing with these things often as black boxes, and they're not clear what could be done, and it's hard for them to have the imagination of what could be achieved with the right computational skills. There, it's hard to have an imagination about an area if you don't know much about it, right? Um. It would be as if someone came to one of you and said, you know, um, tell me about innovations that could be undertaken and, you know, in um, treating lung patients in the ICU. And it's like, well, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, seriously, it's going to be hard for you because you don't, you don't even know quite how it could work or what it's doing now. And, this is really hard for someone to imagine, uh, you know, in terms of uh, their imagination. What's another thing that can go wrong, though, in requirements? Geez. You don't know what exactly the requirements are. You don't know what's the kind of cost of it. Yeah. And so that can mess up a lot. Yeah, so, so the developers, they don't understand how things work in this often other domain. And the folks in the other domain don't understand what's possible and what the trade-offs are, right? They could say, you know, um, could you create me a system doing, you know, working offline, doing voice recognition, uh, and which, you know, will allow me to, um, to to use AI to extract this information. And it's like, well, you know, um, that's really, really not feasible offline to, to do voice recognition in this way without using these proprietary packages, which, which could be used. But, um, you know, basically you start, as developers, you start 
thinking about okay, what's feasible given the GP, the CPU limitations of phones, what's possible offline and online. And, and that's not obvious to the stakeholders. What other things though, concrete things could go wrong. If you're trying to elicit requirements and you're trying to document them, what could go wrong with how you're capturing? Yes, right. Terminology. Terminology, yeah, ambiguous words. That's a lot. So that, that definitely is the case. What what else? A very basic thing. Yeah. Maybe that um, assign too many words. Um, yeah, so there could be there could be um, such a maze of requirements uh, that it's hard to prioritize certain ones or hard to really have the developers keep in mind what's needed. So, that, so that's good. Um, name Mohammed. I was just going to say prioritization. Yeah, so prioritization is up that can be lacking and, and is key. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it turns out that a lot of these things are, are common problems. Incompleteness, like leaving them out, right? You've been dealing a lot with quality issues, you know, uh, issues of ambiguity, for example, or lack of prioritization, um, too many. But one of the biggest quality problems is not having a requirement about it, not mentioning. And if you think about it, incompleteness, like not matching requirements, that can often come up for two extremely, for two extremely different reasons, something could not be mentioned by the stakeholder. One of those two very different reasons, two very different reasons that the stakeholder might not mention any. Yeah, B. That's right. So one is, I'll cut to the chase, one is, they assume you already know. It. I mean, every referologist knows that. <laughs> um, you know, of course, that's how restrictive one disease works. Of course, that's how breathing exercises work. Um, you know, don't we all have noses or what have you? Uh, so they may assume you know it, or it may be it's not a remark. And those are, those appear in the same way. They don't matter, right? And often, assuming you know it is one of the most important things. But they don't think to mention it because, you know, it's not, it's like fish mentioning water, you know, it, it's so, like, what else is there, you know? Um, ambiguity, another one, uh, observational error. So you're taking down the requirements and maybe you mistakenly understood a, a comment, very common, or you would call it incorrectly after the fact. I say conflict. What do we mean by conflict here? I can use it in two ways. Uh, yes, yeah. Ian. Um, you can have conflicting requirements. You can. Yeah. And conflict can particularly occur if there's multiple stakeholders you're interviewing. And one is one vision and one is another. And those visions aren't necessarily the same. Um, I say different origin or origins and category. You mean what I mean by that is some can be the result of a casual thought. Oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could do that? And some are like, this really needs to do that. It's it's core to a topic. So not to have versus the next step, right? Different priorities and things. When I say origin with developers, what do I mean by that? Yeah, why not? Developers Yeah, yeah. It's probably tough to report. Um, I won't comment on on the years, but there is one project for this class where I actually knew a fair bit about the, the project um, me from, from beforehand. And I would come to class and I, I hear the team painting these wild ideas about it. It's to be used in all sorts of different areas. And, you know, maybe in these environments, they think that. And that. Hope they know what they're talking about because. My understanding of the stakeholder means are much more limited than that. I don't think they're talking about you know how their app for X can be used by the Canadian military to do something very different, etc. And it turns out, you know, wouldn't you know, the stakeholder wasn't raising these ideas. The, the developers get so excited about these ideas. And guess what? 
they didn't really blink her in the basement because they're saying, you know, we can do so much, we can be so great, we can add on all these features and, and, and add on all these capabilities, and we can automatically extract this data from, from the images, automatically do optical character recognition, and they couldn't even get the basics, right, uh, in play. They had come up with all these grand schemes, which the stakeholder was not interested in. They just got so excited and they put them into place as a client. And, you know, also it's, uh, there are things that are unnecessarily uh, restrictive. So, so we have, I won't belabor this point. It was mentioned earlier. Look, the sponsor or the client kind of can't clearly envision a solution. As I said, we are constantly living with computational solutions. And we understand how they work. We understand their constraints often. We understand their interfaces. And we can envision things a little bit more easily. They call this, yeah. often they have real trouble with vision of what would it look like. And it may, it's not because they're you know, calling them limitations. It's just, it's, you know, they're not bringing it. Again, like, Imagine you saying, what would the youth ICU look like if we had this extra technology with ECMO or things around all the way? You know, what it looks like. And maybe it's even kind of quickly forgotten. Um, client has trouble often communicating, they may not understand it. Um, they're not really aware of what's feasible or not, what can be done offline, online. You know, whether when you write something for Android, it's also available for iOS, uh, et cetera. The logical steps that have to be taken um, in a solution, like the, the dependencies that exist, right? Uh, uh, or the technological implications. And meanwhile, the tech team, you know, don't often understand the domain specific need. They don't appreciate the gap that exists between what's available now for the client and what, what could be. They they often choose the vision of solutions because they don't understand the domain enough. And they often have trouble parsing the language of the stakeholder. Now, we often, when we're talking about requirements, I want to make a distinction. These are important between a couple of types of requirements. One is between functional and non functional. When I mentioned that, what, what do I mean? What's a, what's a functional requirement? Kind of says it there, but yeah, yeah. Uh, the outcomes, whatever has to be asked. Yeah, yeah. How it, what features it has, right? How it, how it acts, how it behaves, right? What does it do? Like, and how, how do I enjoy it, right? Um, and often there's use cases or use stories associated. We'll talk with about both of those. Uh, and. You know, these often require some dialogue about you know, what do you want to be able to do with this, right? Bread and butter, absolutely key. And generally, when developers think about requirements, this is what their mind goes functional requirements. What does it have to do? What, what, how does the user interact with it? Sometimes they forget about other types of users for. Some of your systems, I know for at least two projects, because how can you trust the sponsor? There's different classes of users. What, like, what are two common different classes of users? Yeah. Main user, sometimes administrator. Yeah, exactly. So there's kind of folks who have responsibility for running a deployment or, or, or handling the oversight of it. And then there's that user, right? Um, common, and it comes up, but often, often for the user, they're not thinking about the administrative side. All they're thinking about is like the end user. What do they see? You know, uh, they're not thinking about who's setting up the content that the user is seeing or who's who's enabling certain content or what have you. Um, but beyond these, which are the more common ones. But they're still over it. There's non functional requirements. And I say non behavioral constraints or requirements, non behavioral needs for the system, things for the system to be successful. What things might there be in non functional requirements? Gee, 
things like this action will go file this category. So, so platform specific availability. Good. What other things are non-functional requirements? Yes. Uh -huh. Like security and scale. For That's right. Exactly. Scalability. What are you about scalability? Anyone? Uh, get more. Uh, being able to increase with more users or more users. Yeah, or, or more more demand. I mean, it could be more hits to your your endpoints on the server side or, or more API calls, but but that's right. It's ability to handle a larger and larger set of of loads or needs associated with it. And commonly it's users, right? And commonly user requests. Oh, that's part of that. Scalability. How does it scale? You know, um, if you have 5,000 many users, how long, how does that impact the latency, the time it takes for it to fulfill the demand of each user, whether it's an API result of an API request or data gives back or, you know, how quickly the web page results. So that's one. Performance is another one that, that I heard you say, you know, well, okay, so, um, Performance of the system. That's good. What is in that precise performance? Yeah. yeah. Reliability. Reliability is good. So, so uh, how how much do we see a degradation in service where sometimes it may not come back in time within some time out period, or to what degree may it go down? Right, availability. Like to what degree is it up all the time? For answering requests, right? You folks may have heard about like triple nines or quadruple nines, like, like system administrators or, or those who administer a system want quality of service guarantees that ensure the system is up 99.99% of the time. And so it's a down for you know, three seconds a year for some of these, or something like that, three you know, three minutes a year, depending on the requirement. Good. What else? There's another key one though that's important for all the projects. Yeah, and Marmik has his hand up. Usability. Yeah, so usability is important for all of them. That's awesome. So not really a functional requirement uh, per se. You could have a system that delivers all the functions, but in a hideously confusing, unintuitive, off-putting, and often Low and cumbersome way, painful, or it could be relatively quick. And by the way, usability is often something which the stakeholders are not set up to really help because, again, they have a hard enough time imagining what it looks like when it comes to having it be slick, right? When it comes to having it be convenient, easy to use, and, you know, um, elegant. That, that's just not something that they're set up to. They, they don't, they can't imagine all these different alternative ways of doing it and say, ah, that one would be much, much, much uh, better, right? It's it's often up to us. And particularly, I like, but anyone in the ISD program, the interactive system design, there's a, there's a specialization for undergrads and actually for graduate students as well. For you know, people who, who focus a lot on things like usability, the, the uh, the usability of a system. Um, so that's good. UX design, right? These are your your requirements. What's something else important for all of the projects? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, the name again? The name. Yes. Maintainability. Yeah. So ability to evolve, to, to keep the system running, and hopefully to update it when new libraries come out, etc. So that's really important in today's environment. You folks. Probably not in a situation where you've got long deployed systems, but I'll tell you, every year we have some systems deployed across the schedule. You got to update them because these libraries get deprecated, right? A new version of iOS comes out, and we have to make sure uh, we stay current. Or you know, Google Google updates its mapping library, and it distinguishes between queries. Um, uh, on the phone, which are coarser location versus higher brand, they require new security regulations if you want higher brand location. And so you have to update that. Okay, just one more thing. 
Yeah, uh -huh. robustness. Yeah, I, I'd say it's related a little bit to reliability, but um, but I like that. You know, um, and it relates to something I'm about to say. And so there's a handout here. Um, yeah. I don't know if Mark is covering that, but I always seem to say you use it on. Okay, yeah, so I, I'd say that's related to the usability, but uh, not 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 quite the same, broader than that, I think. Um, but he, I think it's related to reliability, but maybe speed. Okay, uh, the speed. Uh, so, so that's good. I mean, the performance. We said performance earlier. Mohammed had mentioned that as one of the first. But there's something, something so important that you're not even mentioning. Yes, right. Okay. Um, yeah, so accessibility to people with a variety, like uh, colorblind people, people who are blind, et cetera. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, please put me on my mystery school. Yes. Cost. Okay. Yeah. So, so the cost is the same, but you know, cost is kind of one of those things that results in it. I think in all your efforts. Um, again, it's so obvious to me, you're not even mentioning it. What's it? One of the problems. Yes, Nick. Accessibility, I love it. I love it, and it's related to the accessibility. But it's still not even something more. That's funny. But that's something that's even more exciting. Yes. Uh, so, what? Uh, what? Uh, uh, well, uh, well, uh, yes. I want to say developer models. <laughs> More uh, um, um, oh, okay, maybe there's something there, but uh, yes, uh, Nate, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's a but uh, okay, 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 yeah, there's a big problem. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. If it, if it doesn't work properly, it's generally not matching the requirement, right? Like if, if you say, tell me my taxes, and it gives you something 10 times larger. Yeah, that 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 does impair ability to deliver a requirement, but it's good. Um, correctness is there. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Any? Really, yeah, it's okay to have the compatibility map system with certain other pieces of software. Okay, I got to tell you, we're going to play. Uh, it begins with S, it ends with Y. Security, security, Oh, there you go. Green small circle. Um, so you that was one of the two things you said up front. I said it's performance. Okay. Well, no wonder are you didn't say it. That's awesome. Um, so so I guess I guess I'm I'm the one who got to talk or something. So security, right? Uh uh and um Oh, um, <laughs> so, so security, yeah, security is is absolutely uh, foundational in a lot of today's uh, systems. It includes ability to thwart many types of of malevolent use. Give me, give me a few examples of malevolent use that that might be covered by security. Ability to defend them off. What, what, what are some things? If you that can go wrong with security. See? A data leak. Yeah, so someone could be spying on it, right? Uh, can, can get out information from it that they shouldn't, like the health status of another patient. What's another type of security breach? Yeah. The overloading of every Yeah, some of the uh, denial of service attack. Uh, so that that relates to availability of the system, but it's also can be a security issue for sure. Um, someone is taking malevolent uh, um, control or 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 suppression of 
to your system. What's another thing? Yes, Roger. SQL injection, and that could be used to, yeah, to, to elicit data you shouldn't see, right? And so it's asking you, what is your name? And you put it in a well, statement saying select star from, you know, <laughs> from, from users. Um, and it, it gives you back the playtex passwords and everything else and the name. Got it, got it. But there's something else that happens to security too. So, Tampering with the system, right? So people can log in and tamper with data and, and put in incorrect data or change things. So security is a key thing, um, as Mohammed pointed out. Um, so awesome. Um, now there's another type of distinction though between regular requirements and what are called garage requirements. And this is something that is easily met. Many of us, when we first encounter requirement solicitation, we think, okay, we'll go talk to the stakeholder and find out what their needs are. And that's great. That's a good place to start. Superb place to start. But one of the reasons it's a superb place to start but not finish is that from those requirements extend a whole set of derived requirements. And the requirements from the user are the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole set here underneath the water that's the broader set of the iceberg. And you gotta watch out because if you're Titanic, it's the your cup. So why do I say that? These are called derived requirements, and they come about for many reasons, but one of them is that the user mentions what they want. If we're lucky, it includes not just functional requirements, but non-functional requirements. Like, hey, uh -huh, the system has to be safe, and has to be secure, um, right? Um, but beyond that, there's a set of technologic constraints that they won't know. Jean mentioned some of these things earlier, but the point is there'll be a set of needs that are implied by the state of today's technologies. What sort of bandwidth can be supported on a Wi-Fi connection, right? Uh, what, what sort of things you can enable in terms of Bluetooth connectivity? Um, Limitations on the memory footprint you can have for a for an app on a phone. Uh, the fact that background apps within the context of smartphones um, generally are not able to use certain functionality that's available to foreground apps. The fact that there are certain certain things that are not available when you're offline that may be web resources, right? And if someone is up in northern Saskatchewan on a canoe trip, or maybe up in certain areas on the reserve, there might not be cell tower connection. And you're not going to be able to be online and therefore have access to certain types of resources that you might otherwise use. The fact that certain types of hardware, let's say you only versions of Oculus, might only support up to a certain number of data points to be, to be displayed simultaneously. That ray tracing algorithms only run so, so fast. That smartphones take a lot of power to process, say, on the phone, say, for, for you know, natural language processing and translating um, from language into text or what have So the point is, with us in technology, we're always thinking about you know, what's possible with a GPU or what's possible with a smartphone. What can we do with a Wi-Fi connection versus a data, cell data connection? We know roughly you know, what the constraints are of these, uh, these uh, types of environments. And we know how much memory you know, a smartphone might have on the upper side and on the lower side. We know something about what's possible for foreground background that. And the user, the end user doesn't know any of this. And so if they say, I want this thing to run on smartphone, um, 
you know, one of the questions you'll ask is, oh, um, you know, does it mean to run on both platforms? And for all they know, they, they just think, you know, you build an app. Oh, I mean, apps are different on iPhone and Android. That's not obvious to an end user, but because any one of them is probably only using one of those, and they don't know that it's requires different languages or, or you know, explicit cross-platform development to create both. The point is that most requirements are not given by the user. Most requirements extend from those user requirements interacting with constraints of platforms. You know, they, they end up building on those requirements and and then entailing a whole set of other needs, a whole set of other constraints that like this system needs to fit in less than 10 gigabytes of, of memory. So, you know, the downloadable app to be downloaded from the Google Play Store um, needs to be smaller than X or what have you. And, and these things, these things occupy a lot of lives of technology. The user doesn't care about this, right? He said, the user might say, I didn't ask you to, you know, make this thing really power saving. But for the technologists, we know if we don't do that, it's going to drain the battery of the iPhone um, and an Android phone within you know, six hours. And so we have to put a lot of effort into cleverness to reduce the power footprint or the memory footprint or the CPU demand or, or what have you. Or we have to bend over backwards to handle offline access. What the user didn't ask, uh, ask for it, but the functionality they requested implies that it has to be handled offline access. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? So, a lot of our requirements, you don't hear from the user. You hear from the user kind of their precursor. And then you have to figure out all these extra requirements. You know, do you see what I mean by this? They're very, very common, you know? Um, and in a given application, you can often list quite a few of these derived requirements. Um, okay, now I want to talk at least a little bit in the remaining time about three major ways of handling documentation of requirements. And I want to get an understanding for this cohort. You, you folks uh, have gone through recent iterations of 370, 270, and, and then earlier, maybe 141 or 145, and et cetera. And I don't. Over the years, things have changed a lot about what's covered in those courses. So I, I don't actually know, for your iterations of those, what was covered. To what degree, um, I want some indications of, so I can figure out how much time to put into different ones of these, these discussions. How many people in one of those courses discuss user story? Okay, awesome. So that was 370? Yes. Okay, I'm going to go very light on that. Then. How about Use cases, formal use cases. Was that at 370 as well? Okay, um, good. And did you write use cases um, or did you examine use cases given to you or what? Or did you just kind of learn about them at Yeah. We did write the use cases. Okay. And did you write use case kind of accompanying diagrams for those also part of that? Okay, showing different classes of users interacting with the system and the different needs. Okay. Um, what class was that? Okay, and, and user stories also in 370? Very good. Okay. Um, how about formal system requirements specification documents? Did any of you do one of those? Okay. Those are older school documents. You still see them around, they're called SRSs uh, in short. Um, but uh, I'm going to go very briefly then over much of this so we can finish with a bit of other material. So, you know, generally speaking, in my, my career lifetime, there's been an evolution of kind of four major stages in 
with respect to attitudes towards uh, requirements. Uh, when I started as a professional programmer, the attention uh, was just starting to really be put on the importance of requirements. And for many projects, they were less heavily documented uh, and handled somewhat more informally. But in my opening years of my development career, um, system requirement specifications came along. And later use cases with object-oriented development and work uh, with UML. I think you folks have seen UML diagrams quite a bit. Um, good. Those um, really invested heavily in, in use cases. And then more recently with the rise, particularly of agile development and you know Scrum and extreme programming and, and uh, spiral model and, and uh, techniques uh, involving uh, Kanban and others, um, you, you have developments uh, of user stories. And I think you're generally familiar, you know, the common form of, of user stories. He's taken a couple, couple of different forms, right? As a role, I want to be able to do X so that Y is the case. Sometimes it's like as a who under certain conditions, certain land or where I want to be able to to accomplish something. And often these are written down on cards. Did you discuss this in 370? Like the use of cards to document user stories? And actually, the use of cards to mention user stories. It, um, Ron Jeffries often comments that, look, um, user stories involve three big things. One is a card which says in brief, in the briefest terms like this, um, or like this, um, for, for some examples from this class, you know, that documents the, 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 the slogan of the story. But as, as uh, uh, Coburn said, a use of story is a promise for a conversation. And really, the card is kind of a reminder to have a broader conversation about this piece. It's kind of a shorthand for, I need to that's what I'm thinking about, and I need to have a broader conversation. The conversation cannot be replaced by the card. There's also a broader understanding that the card is standing for, but the card says it is real. And then finally, and I don't know how much this was discussed, we have 370. There's the need to think about confirmation um, of this user story. In other words, has it been properly delivered? And there's criteria uh, for judging proper confirmation. Uh, did you folks in 370 talk about these kind of needs for user stories in the advanced framework, right? There could be independent, not tangled together, but really quite independent, it can be negotiable and valuable and, and estimable. You know, what what is this referred to? Estimable. What is what is that referring to? Yes, and if you uh, need to hold on to uh, yeah, exactly. So having some sense, sometimes it's jelly beans, sometimes it's it's a statement of you know um just more abstract um uh points associated with it, but how long will it take? How much effort will it take to to deploy this, right? To to develop it. To be small, so it's it's easily estimated. If, if it's too big, it's hard to estimate. It's too inchoate, it's hard to think through in very concrete terms. And it should be testable. Um, and I'm glad you got exposure to that. It's 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 uh, important stuff. Now, I should note that there's a, for each of these areas, there's uh, some nice literature. The whole area of confirmation has some techniques associated with it for, um, for documenting uh, whether or not a user story is in fact achieved. Uh, and and you know, if, if people are interested, you can you can look at that. Use cases are an older technique, but one that's been adopted, I like Alan uh, Ellis Toss framework for agile functional requirements. Um, and the use cases, you know, tell a story that focus on some user goals. And there's many components, so I'll mention, but I think you're probably broadly familiar with them. One advantage is they can be understood by many non-technical users, including stakeholders. 
And, um, you know, it, if there's a lot of complexity in user interaction, it can be, it can be quite valuable. So, you know, broadly, we identify like this, this diagram, uh, identify all system users, uh, you know, selecting uh, a user and then basically describe their course through the system, different possible courses that can happen, both main ones and alternative ones, identifying commonalities, um, and, and then, uh, you know, you're going through this for different sets of users. And so essentially, you're for each use case, and this has been um, particularly documented early on by Alistair Coburn um, from the UK. But uh, do you folks use Marvin's book at all in the 70s? That's still, still um, okay. So, uh, Marvin has uh, a good book on, um, on uh, UML. UML in practice and had some good discussions with it. But broadly, a use case will often include name, scope of use case, uh, the level of it, primary actors and stakeholders, preconditions, you know, what, what is guaranteed by success and what's the main scenario, then alternative scenarios, special requirements. I, I think you folks have probably seen this before as pieces of a use case. Like preconditions and what's accomplished at the end, the, the post conditions and identifying the actors, right? So, one thing that students often get confused about is there's a common form of diagram that many applying that's used called the use case context diagram. This is not the use case, this is a illustration that summarizes some components and describes where it's taking place, right? Who are these folks over here? Can anyone tell me? What are, what are these over here? Yes, they're the actors. They're the various actors, that's right. And we we can't have other actors over here, sometimes in supporting roles, including types of systems that will interact. Um, but here are, what are these various things? Anyone? They are, yes. That is exactly right. So this gives the context of the use case in which, you know, uh, a return handling use case takes place or cause of sale. And these involve different combinations of actors. So, right? Uh, so for the cash in, maybe it's customer and the HR system. Um, or for the system administrator, they're managing the security where the customer is not involved, right? Um, so these use cases are often put in context here, and then we, you know, we'll actually write right through. This is for a uh, um, related system from this Larman book. Um, but the actual use case is a written document. This is sometimes missed because some students get confused between the diagram and the use case. The use case requires systematically writing out you know, steps that users, actors go through when interacting with the system and often putting in alternative flows. Why would you put alternative flows for use case? I mean, or, or to describe system interaction with users. Why would you need alternative flows? Uh, yeah, and everything? Sussy. Sussy, yes. Yeah, or yeah. unexpected events that come up, right? There's a, the network space. What's another one? You know, even just a fall error, right? Uh, there's a problem with with network being too busy, there's a timeout, uh, issues with some user error, you know, in, in, in interacting with it, right? Problem of 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 uh, you know not not adhering to the guidelines for insurance things. Um uh, system downtime, whatever it is, or these alternative flows, right? And any you know, robust zoom ins. Um, for all of these alternative flows, we have to describe what happens. So all this is is nice and 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 uh, helps us be clear about what these steps are. What what are some shortcomings of use cases? Can you go over What are some places where use cases? They they don't deliver as much value as we want, or they can impede 
the dog. What, what are some issues with coming up with these cases early on? What's not the law? Anyone? There's a number of known shortcuts we've used here. Yes, no, no. maybe that they assume the like religious uh, sequence that you're going to take between the uh, actors as involved with the movie. Okay, so I like what you're saying, and I think you're on to something important. Um, so there are ways in which this is rigid, and it's particularly rigid. Often, with if you're not careful, you can write it rigidly with respect to the UI. And the issue is, user interfaces are one of those areas of system functionality that often evolve dramatically with changed user needs, with changed customer needs. And so these are often quite coupled, if they're not built really carefully, with too low level a set of details about the UI interaction. And the U.S. can involve a lot in all. It will lead to really big interactions. And that's probably more being pinned down by more details than you really want, because it makes it cumbersome for the sponsor to say, well, I was thinking about it that way, but why don't we combine these two screens together? Or why don't we actually collect that information up front when the user first registers instead of getting it, you know, every time the user is requesting X, Y, or Z, right? So coupling to the UI is one thing. How about other things that are problematic about this? Well, time is running down. I'll, I'll just say they're not great for getting non-functional requirements and, and, and capture non-user facing um, The complex series of conditions, it can be really cumbersome to write down this linear way. And um, you know, very technical detail, probably like, say algorithmic reasoning. Um, can be can be uh, can be challenging. I'll just give uh, in the next, in the last minute or so here. I'll note that older school work um, made use of what are called functional requirements, which were documented typically in in a system requirements document written in clear sort of prescriptive style. You know, the patron shall be able to reorder any meal. He or she had ordered within the previous six months, provided all food items on that order available on the menu for the meal date. These are very um, sort of uh, uh, stylized descriptions of what shall be guaranteed by the system. Um, and I've given you a bunch of examples here as I have for, for uh, uh, user stories as well. Um, these system requirement specs, SRSs, um, uh, are still quite widely used um, as part of the set of documents. But you also have other documents which describe it as higher level product requests, marketing requirements documents, vision and scope documents. These are all very high level. And then you get into these system requirements documents, which are, are lower level and sort of lay things out in this prescriptive way. This is an older style that dates back many decades um, and was more common when I was starting out as a younger developer in the, the 80s and, and early 90s. Um, but, um, you know, today's environment, um, use cases and user stories are still particularly uh, common in agile development as well. So a few tips I want to leave you with. Um, when you talk to a stakeholder through the search department, repeat an understanding back to them. They ask, ask them for what they want and then repeat it back to them. Why would you do that? Anyone? Yeah, rather. Yeah. That's right. You make sure your understanding and that it's expressed in your terms. They may, if you ask them to repeat it, they may repeat it in the same terms that you don't really understand. So if you repeat it back, you ensure you've got good communication, right? You can't ask the stakeholders to repeat, but better yet is uh, repeating it back to them. Um, put a, a priority on linking up requirements to other areas of your of your system. Um, earlier it was said, I think it was G, who noted requirements are tied into other documents. 
They don't blame the model, right? Requirements motivate design problems. They motivate reviews to, to dive document compliance for the department. Yeah. Code that are written to achieve the goals of those departments. Document that traceability. Why do you document traceability? Yes. Okay, who proposed it is, is, is important, but also if that department changes, you know what has to be changed. You know what has to be done, right? Or updates. Priorities and structure accepted steps around them. Um, think about hidden and particularly drawn departments. We talked about it, these things that are under the water. Think not just what you hear from the stakeholder, but what that is. Lies in terms of what has to be done. Okay. Um, uh, good, good, good. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave the other ones now to let you out. But um, requirements gathering is hard. Elicitation is hard. And, um, you know, I, I hope uh, this will give you some steps forward for, for capturing uh, additional, additional components of requirements. Thanks very much. And I will see you folks on.